Thanks so much for that Kara update. Now we're gonna join our next guest. I'm excited coming all the way from Switz or Zurich, Switzerland. We have Daniel McGregor. Daniel, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Hello, thanks very much. It's uh, nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. And Daniel, you're a co-founder. Please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Nexiot, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So I founded the company uh, back in 2015. And, um, you know, we've uh, we've had great success as a leader in uh, global trade tech, which is uh, our our name for integrated solutions around uh, digital supply chain. And speaking of freight tech and digital digitalization around the supply chain, we always hear lately around, of course, freight tech and what's going on with all the really impressive technology around trucks and freight and transportation. But what's been going on with the railroad sector? Yeah, so I mean, I think um, when I initially started the company, the the the, the idea was to um, monitor the shipping containers, the you know, sort of twenty to thirty million shipping containers uh, in the world, and um, you know, these are non-powered mobile assets, and this makes it quite different to you know monitoring. Uh, vehicles that have native power. Um, you have to solve various challenges on the hardware side first. Um, this obviously includes on the battery, um, the power management, and um, and then what to do with the data and how to manage that process of creating value from the data. So um, we started looking at the shipping lines, and then we moved uh, quickly to rail because you know we knew that we were sort of needing to to get some traction. And uh, when we approached the rail market, we saw that there were lots of challenges that needed to be solved. Um, you know certainly around maintenance, around operations, around asset utilization and deployments. But then uh, very quickly, when we spoke to our rail customers, we realized that um, one of the major challenges is to create new digital services for other stakeholders in the value chain. Um, and obviously, this means the cargo owner, the shipper, um, ports and terminals, uh, customs and all the other stakeholders and participants, um, you know, through the through that network. And looking into rail right now, especially in the U.S., we're having problems not only with a lack of engineers, but at service levels. And so what you all are offering, especially with visibility for stakeholders, can you describe a little bit uh, in detail, you know, what are some of the benefits of actually, uh, you know, how can you speed this up? How can we actually find these containers? Because it appears right now, once it leaves the stacks and it gets on the train, it just disappears for five to seven days, at least in the U.S., and then you hope it gets there. Yeah, that's certainly true. And, uh, you know, we've um, obviously when you talk about shipping containers, we've got um, uh, some major developments that have just been announced in the last last few weeks, which is that Nexiot is equipping, um, you know, the, the, the large part of the Hapag Lloyd uh, shipping container fleet, um, you know, so over a million containers. This is the holy grail um, of the uh, maritime space. It's been talked about for many years since the invention of GPS and the, you know, sort of the, the the popularization of, of mobile network communication and so on. And uh, now actually we see it going ahead. So we won't be losing those, um, those assets like previously. But let's just uh, look back at rail for a second. You know, when we look at a shipping a rail car, um, for example, when something happens to that rail car, there tends to be a lot of pointing and uh, a lot of blaming, a lot of, um, you know, sort of uh, discussion over whose responsibility something is. So we take a simple event like when something gets hit or impacted, then, um, you know, obviously, if there's damage done, if there's if the goods is uh, goods are damaged, if the if the, the assets uh, derailed or something like this. Um, previously, you know, it's been difficult to attribute responsibility. It's been difficult to change business processes to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, obviously, we cover our rail car with sensors. Um, we take that data to the cloud. We do pattern recognition on the shock curve. We know exactly what caused the event, the location and the time of that. And then we can create business process outcomes. So automation of business processes. And that's really what everybody needs. And that's where the value is going to be created so that you can actually you know, enable humans to do a better job with the right tools in hand. Back to the container, you know, it simply shouldn't happen that these things disappear. Um, you know, we it's not just the first and last mile, but it's all kinds of, you know, actions and, and processes along the way. So, you know, when you're working with third 
parties or when you're actually uh, taking uh, taking over uh, ownership of that asset for that part of the journey you need to align with the other modalities you need real data and i think this is what what it comes down to is that everybody needs real actual real time uh, live asset and cargo data in order to provide uh, you know a better service to their customer and also um, you know manage their relationships with partners and responsibilities through that value network as well and Daniel, when I think to my initial point of how far freight tech has come and really looking to implement some of those innovations into the rail industry, what aspects are you seeing that might get adopted first and how can some of these things really kind of start to drive things like efficiency? Yeah, so we, we've we've noticed obviously a lot of momentum in recent months, um, you know, and years uh, specifically from organisations like Rail Pulse, which is the uh, coalition between the different rail operators in the in the North American market. And you know, there's a new level of collaboration uh, actually starting to take place. And you know, obviously that 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 relies on um, you know some partnerships and sharing data and so on. But you know, I think with all of these things, you know, when you if you boost efficiency on your own and then you hand over over that assets, you know, it goes outside of your um, your uh, control, and if efficiency then starts to suffer because they don't have the same standards or data or capabilities, um, then obviously, um, you know, all of the gains that you've made on your side are lost as soon as it goes over that border or outside of your your control. So I think it's something that needs to happen across the entire, um, you know, sort of uh, ecosystem. That all parties need a part of that data, and we have to collaborate and share ideas and share training sets and algorithms and things to actually keep driving this and pushing it forward. But obviously with the new bipartisan, uh, you know, agreement on infrastructure and the new Chrissy grants and so on, there's a lot of funding coming into the space. And this obviously uh, needs to be spent on technology that's already tested and already trusted uh, in order to get the maximum uh, return on investment in the fastest way possible. Looking at the data as well as some of the challenges that come with telematics, trying to collect this data, uh, were there anything that surprised you or any specific hurdles that you have to overcome when we are trying to equip these containers? Because, you know, when you get, whether you're trying to send the data up to get it, uh, is there any issues where it gets lost in the stack? I know sometimes with even uh, concrete and Wi-Fi, you can have a hard time. So there, was there anything that you all found that was surprising or had to overcome when just trying to even send this data out? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think the first thing is, I mean, this is our Glow Popper 3 device. We have 200,000 of these deployed already on rail cars across the world. And we have, it, obviously, uh, there's a sort of an energy harvesting component here. And this enables, um, you know, the device to stay alive. The device has to be smart enough to stay alive and keep sending its data. Then we've got to manage the data itself and make sure that, you know, we're managing the packet size of data down and so on. Also, the price points of the hardware, we have to make sure that it's uh, possible to deploy on large numbers a full fleet you don't want to manage a fleet within a fleet this is the device that's going to be equipped onto the hapag Lloyd shipping containers and as you can see it's a bit smaller um, but essentially um you know it's got the same technology in it but it has to send at a different different frequency because on the rail side we need to send every five minutes to you to to uh, you know enable all the use cases this is the next device that's just been released this is the one that's going to be collecting the data from knorr ems as braking and hvac and subsystems. And this is an incredible opportunity to gather a whole lot of data. And obviously, this is a slightly different application because it's powered. You don't see the solar panel there. So, uh, you know, there are uh, practical uh, considerations, and creating hardware is extremely hard. Uh, you know, in a way, it's no surprise that um, Silicon Valley started chasing asset light investments and started to reduce their interest in hardware. But essentially, with the hardware as a critical enabler to, to keep the data flowing and to enable a high quality of data at the right frequency to be able to enable all of the interesting uh, return on investment and use cases that, that we can uh, develop with customers together. And Daniel, looking forward uh, within this segment, are there any benchmarks or standard that you're looking for, the, for in the industry, um, whether it's over the next six months, year, maybe even five years out? I think it's extremely important to have standards and uh, you know everybody has to agree on the on the basic technologies especially on the hardware side. I think that's pretty much been done now because you know the standards are fairly common sense. We've got bluetooth low and uh, low energy, we've got you know the 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 cell, cellular networks, we've got satellite optionality uh, and um, and then NFC and um, and mesh network capabilities as well. So uh, you know there's not much sort of shifting there but in terms of the data standards and the standards around relationships of the state 
stakeholders and the sharing of that data is it's very important and that needs to sort of evolve uh, you know considerably i would say um it, there's a question over where does the IP or the business advantage come from? Uh, you know, if people are sharing data or if people are holding on to data, do, do they create the, the you know the IP? Be on the uh, on the business case side by creating new business models, uh, new um, you know collaborative models, uh, outcome based economics, and so on. And with this, all really makes sense in order to get the best out of this. It's a collective effort, and we have to have standards for sure. So it's really important that Rail Pulse and organisations like this, you know, keep talking and keep agreeing these standards and pushing the whole thing for the whole market. We really do appreciate it, Daniel. I'm gonna, I'm definitely have to keep an eye out, especially on the developments and uh, the hardware side as well. Though, such a great point. Silicon Valley takes the easy way out. It feels like. Yeah, well, anyway, I mean, to be honest, there's the hardware's, you know, sort of well well underway now. And, uh, you know, the main thing is now extracting value from the data, but the, not all data's, con, you know, comparable. And those that are aggregating data, they struggle with laggy, you know, laggy data or historical data, whereas we're taking real prime data directly from the asset and directly from the cargo, which is the game changer, I believe. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We'll definitely have to have you back and follow up on how this is all developing. But right now, we're going to take a short break, but we'll be right back with more Freight Waves Now.